Um, so onto our first webinar of the day, how to run effective heritage webinars. I am thrilled and delighted, um, many other superlatives to welcome onto the screen, my esteemed charity digital colleague, Mimi Morrill, and in my totally unbiased opinion, the best event manager <laughs> going. Um, now you may not know it, but if you have been to any of our previous heritage digital events, you'll have experienced a webinar or many webinars managed by Mimi. Uh, and she's here today to share a few tidbits on how you can be using webinars in your organization. Welcome. Mimi, good morning. Hello. It is very weird being on this side. I'm not going to lie to you. I am very nervous. So please be kind to me, everyone. Hopefully I can do this justice. Um, I am going to go straight into it, though, um, so I don't waste any of your time. Uh, just a little bit about us here at Charity Digital, if you don't know already. Our mission is to help charities be more digital. Um, we recently partnered with, well, I say recently, but it was back in July, um, par partnered with our heritage partners to expand this onto those heritage organisations. So that is why we are here with you today and as Chris mentioned we've been throwing a number of webinars into the ring and I'm kind of here to show you how you can do it. Um, digital is a brand new way of communicating and um, there's so many different options that you can reach out to your different beneficiaries organizations to be able to communicate them in a digital way but what actually is a webinar? Um, I found this quote when I was researching for this session and I quite enjoyed it. I did want to find one on Zoom, but they didn't have one for me. So I got one from GoToWebinar. Um, and it says, a webinar is an online seminar that turns a presentation into a real-time conversation from anywhere in the world. I think that kind of gives us that, that confirmation that a webinar is whatever you want it to be. It's just online. So if you do want it to be a public talk, an educational session for small on a small or a large scale, it's completely up to you. It's just putting it on that digital platform. Um, so don't feel overwhelmed that you're not ticking a webinar box, whatever that box may be. That's just kind of how I wanted to start this session today. Um, Chris mentioned our Heritage Digital webinars. Hopefully you have attended a few. If you haven't, they are available on our site. But as I mentioned, we have been running them since July with the Heritage organizations. Um, we've been, kind of defining a webinar as talking to a couple of having the t tech trainers deliver those webinars better than I do but us being in the background and them delivering those webinars with their experience and um, we have it more on a like we are today where the audience are kind of not as involved with the conversation but that live Q&A at the end of the webinar gives that interaction and we have a live host that introduced that like Chris is doing today to keep the conversations going and um, we've also been doing this at Charity Digital for the past two years um, and we've seen a really good kind of response from our webinars so that is why we are here today to kind of share those tips and tricks that I've kind of developed over the past years. So for me, I think webinars are broken down into five different steps. And Andrew co covered a couple of those in the, his previous session. Um, so this complements quite nicely. But I think your main focuses need to be audience, time, topic, place, and plan. Now, the, this deck is quite detailed, but that is more so that you can go back to it afterwards. Um, and it's kind of your source of truth. Um, we ourselves have a checklist that we create that we have for all our webinars. And um, so it might be worth creating your, your own after this. But I will go into the different nuances and everything kind of you want to consider as you're going through these processes. And in a sense, create an effective webinar. Obviously, these are my five top tips, so it may be completely different for you. It may be that this sparks some, something in you that thinks, actually, maybe it's not time, maybe it's something else for me. So happy to discuss that also in the extended Q&A. So let's start off, audience. Before you start, you actually wanna ask yourself, are webinars the right thing for your audience? If they aren't yet, that's okay. You just need to kind of see what might be the right thing for your audience if it is getting them into a zoom meeting or on a teams or something where you're kind of bringing them in a digital community maybe not calling it a webinar because the word webinar might scare them that's kind of what you want to start thinking first of all throughout your whole journey of creating webinars i am going to keep coming back to your audience because at the end of the day you are producing this content for your audience so you want to be keeping them in mind throughout the whole process You'll learn from them as you go. We still do. And it's we had our 
an, a conference the other week and it was amazing the findings that we got after it because our audience have completely changed in the past year due to COVID and everything else that's going on I think people's daily life has just completely taken a turn and, and what they want from content has changed also so you need to listen to that. Next, we're going into time. Um, so there are many different aspects of time. It's not just kind of deciding when and where and how long for. You've got to kind of go into this a little bit more. So going back to the audience, what would work for your audience? So for us, we think that, and hopefully we're not completely wrong here, but we host ours on Tuesday morning for the heritage audience. However, at Charity Digital, we host ours on a Thursday afternoon. That's not only due to our own capacity, it's also due to what we think works for our audience currently. You do need to keep going back to that and maybe kind of see if times change, do you need to relook at that? If it's a school holiday, should you maybe miss that week? Kind of take into consideration other factors that are going on. Um, one thing you do want to do is kind of make things consistent. So. Chris mentioned this briefly earlier about Netflix series. He always goes on about this to us. You want to kind of create that buzz around your webinars. So by being consistent, so once you've picked your day, you want to be consistent with that. You want to, you want people to be like, oh, is that Tuesday webinar happening that I thought was going to happen last week? Can I, can I see if it's on the website? And then they'll organically go to your website to sign up for that webinar. So you want to kind of keep that in mind as you're going. However, I am going to con contradict myself here because you want to be honest with your capacity. If we've, we've currently been able to get to a point at Charity Digital where we can host a fortnightly webinar. However, it did take us about a year to get there and be able to have the resources in the house to produce that. So I'm not saying go back to the offices today, virtual offices, and decide, right, we're going to do a webinar next week and we're going to produce one weekly after that. You want to plan it out. We'll get to plan in a bit, but you do want to think about this in the end, like at the start. Don't kind of run before you walk. If you kind of just want to put one webinar out there, see how it does on a Tuesday morning. Don't still Tuesday morning, go Wednesdays. On a Wednesday, then you can see what the audience feel like, what the feedback is like from that, and then take that on board and relook at it next time. I am jumping ahead here because I know what's coming next. But then you want to think about webinar duration. So you've decided your day, you've decided your time. You want to keep your audience engaged, but you don't want to keep them there too long. So how, what's the kind of balance with the conversation and the content? So like I said, today we've got Chris hosting this virtual event. By having a live host amongst all the speakers, that that provides a contrast in voice which then keeps people engaged for longer which is quite nice it also puts the speaker at ease because they're not speaking constantly for an hour trying to share their slides trying to answer the Q&A trying to do the chat you're kind of looking after your speaker at the same time so you want to think about going back to your capacity how long can you do a webinar for how long can you keep your audience engaged for and also listen to your audience. So when lockdown first started for us, um, we used to be quite, before lockdown, we used to be quite strict to timing. But then when lockdown started, we realized that there were so many questions people were asking that we just didn't have the time to answer them. But then people were getting frustrated because they weren't getting answers to their questions. So then we started speaking to our speakers and saying, would you be happy to stay online a little bit after your session so that those that do want to have that conversation can talk to you and our speakers loved it they were happy to do that so we did that for a period of time we then noticed that actually people changed and wanted to get offline straight away and then they were getting frustrated because they weren't able to see all the content so now we've stopped doing that and we've created this extended q a vibe where people can have that conversation afterwards it's not always possible we don't do it for all our webinars um, but we do do it for our virtual events. So I think it's taking, listening to what your audience is saying and kind of taking that into consideration is so important. Um, your audience is very wise. I mean, ours definitely is. Okay, next, topics. So for topics, I know this is a busy, busy slide. I do apologize. I did want to break it up, but then it just, I've kept it as it is. But I wanted you to think about a couple of things when you're thinking about educational content. Um, what is best suited again to your audience what are they wanting to hear more about what are they going to 
gain from attending your sessions what are you going to give them that they haven't heard before and how are you going to give it to them in that way um we have a couple of examples here so obviously heritage digital we ran the smaller events and we ran them on an educational kind of lecture virtual event type way and that's where we have different um different experts coming in and talking about different topics and different content and kind of making sure that that's highlighted during their session. We spend a lot of time with our speakers to make sure kind of the end goal isn't transitioned, but it's making sure that your the content that you're giving is going to be beneficial to those that are attending, because if if it's not, they will drop off and you'll notice that they you'll notice in the feedback that it's not quite right. And so again, it's taking that on board and listening to what your audience is saying and making sure you're meeting their expectations. Um, one thing to talk about also here is what does your audience already have expert knowledge of? So many in the heritage sector, are people who have specialism, whether it's relevant or whether they're working. I feel like it's good to know what else is out there and what experts can come in and talk on those topics larger event examples, which I'll share all the links to these examples because it might be really useful for you to kind of go out and watch webinar, other webinars in the sector to see what others are doing to be like, oh, maybe I can steal that. And I have a speaker that could be quite good on that and talk in a different way, one that will suit my audience. So I'll share all these links afterwards. Um, but the Egypt Expl Exploration Society and the Georgian Group do kind of weekly webinar series. So they're larger events. I think they are paid for, um, but they are a mixture of online sessions, lectures, training courses, and some panel discussions. Um, and they're all held through Zoom. Um, and I think that's a good place to kind of have a look what they're offering. If you can't attend because it is paid for, that's absolutely fine. But maybe just read the blurb, see what the speaker's like, look on YouTube, see if there's any other sessions that that speaker's done previously on a similar topic. Um, and also the Heritage Digital Series are all free, so you can take a look at those. Um, they're all on the website. Okay, next we want to talk about place. So this is quite a big one for me, I feel, because I feel it is just as important to pick the virtual location as it would be to pick the physical location. It is a completely different experience though. So you need to keep that in mind. You're not gonna be going into a venue if you have had the pleasure of looking at other venues. You're not gonna be able to go in there, have a cup of tea, have a chat with a venue manager and kind of lay, lay out your plan and get their ideas. When you're looking for a virtual platform, you're gonna be talking with tech people so there's going to be a lot of jargon that maybe you don't really kind of fully understand I definitely don't when I'm talking to them um but maybe don't start at that high mark start at what you know so we use zoom webinars for all our virtual events and all our webinars and that's purely because I know how to use it and I feel confident using it so therefore my audience will feel conf confident listening to us because we're not faffing about in the background like Zoe's here today you barely know that she's there because she's running everything so smoothly but she's there to help you if there are any problems so I think that all comes back to being confident and going with what you know best kind of trusting your instinct if you don't kind of use a virtual platform already that's absolutely fine but maybe reach out to your audience kind of see what platforms they're used to using there's so many out there there's Teams, there's Zoom, there's GoToWebinar, there's Hopin. Some of them can be quite expensive, but also some of them aren't. So have a look what it is. And also some people already have them downloaded. Like I'm sure all of us have Teams downloaded already or Zoom somewhere in our pack. Um, and if not, then you could maybe look at a Facebook Live or something like that, but you're going kind of different down different routes with the different platforms. So the key things that you wanna take into consideration are what is the webinar production actually like? So what is the experience like for your attendees? So what does your production team, I say, we, we say team, but it is just Zoe today. Um, what, what experience will that be like for them? And then also what will the experience be like for your attendees joining? How will they join? You wanna look at it on both sides. What is the signups situation like do they have to sign up in two different places and I know you do for our webinars you register on the heritage digital website and then you register on the zoom webinar register website and that's just so that we know who's coming to what 
um, events and who's kind of taking part in them and that helps us with our data to be like okay we had a 40 percent conversion here that's great what can we do next time to kind of keep that going um what is the security and data handling like for the platform obviously that platform itself is going to be capturing quite a lot of data so you want to know kind of how that works and make sure it's suitable for you um we also have an automated email functionality with our platform. And I think it's good to kind of check if that's available, because I think the last thing that everyone wants is to have to be sending that final email just before you're going live. Um, because there's with a virtual event, you're in 10 places at once. The last thing you want to be thinking is, have I sent that email? You want to kind of make sure that goes without you even thinking about it. Um, recording. So this is a big one. We've all been guilty. Well. I say we all have, but I definitely have, of not pressing that record button. Um, the thing that I love about Zoom is that you can set it up before you go live so that it automatically records. I'm sure there's so many other platforms that do that also, um, but you wanna make sure that recording is available. Even if it's not kind of something that's set up in advance, put, post it on your screen or kind of write yourself a note. I tend to do that or write one on my hand, which then ends up getting rubbed off. But put it somewhere to remind yourself, OK, I need to click record. Is recording available? Because you want to be able to share that content afterwards. You don't want it to just be a one time thing. And then finally, accessibility. Um, it's such an important part of virtual events now. You need you want to be being as accessible as you can. Um, we've got an integration with Rev on our webinars. It's not the best, it is AI, so it's not 100%. So I do apologize if it is going all over the show right now, but it's a step in the right direction. And I think that's what we all need to be doing is making sure we're kind of moving in the right direction and trying to make a conscious effort to be as accessible as we can. Okay, moving on to audience engagement. So this was quite an interesting one for me because I when I was I got quite excited when I was making this this deck and I was like oh yeah maybe I'll do a poll maybe I'll do this maybe I'll kind of have a go at it but then I realized I'm not a confident speaker I'm actually quite nervous if I put a poll into the mix I'm gonna fluster and it's not gonna make my audience feel comfortable so I decided against it and I think as much as you want your focus to be engage your audience you also want your speaker to be comfortable so you want to kind of find that balance with if they don't feel okay with doing a poll don't force them to do one do let them do what they feel comfortable doing and also go through that process with them so they know what it what it actually means like what does a poll actually mean um, and what would that look like on the day slide sharing so i am doing that today as everyone can see um i think that helps i think slides always help because you don't want to be just staring at my face um obviously you want to make sure your slides are as accessible as possible i know our contrasting isn't 100 percent, and we need to work on that but it's it's kind of keeping that in mind the whole time videos are really great to use but you do need to be prepared with a video that if it doesn't play properly um have your host or have your speaker kind of talk over it so if the sound doesn't work or if the internet crashes which it tends to do make sure you're prepared to kind of talk over that and continue going um and then the q a so it definitely helps having a q a at the end because then it doesn't feel like the attendees are at a lecture because you're not you're part of this i've developed this for you to kind of learn from and also for me to learn from so that q a at the end will be so useful because I'll probably find find out so much information from what you've all been doing and what you want to be doing. And also, like, like it says, pop it in the chat, share kind of your experiences of what you've been doing in the past year. Have you ventured into webinars yet? Have you tried it with your audience? Have you learned anything? If not, are you going to? Like kind of where are you at with this? Okay, I'm getting into this. Let's see, plan. Um, I am conscious of the time but plan is quite a big thing. So I'm gonna go into it as much as I can, but like I said, you'll have all these slides available to you. So you can go back to it. You can create yourself your own checklist and kind of make sure you're going through the phases. But when it comes to webinars, we try to plan as early as we can. We give ourselves a minimum of four weeks because you can't just go out and decide, I'm gonna do a webinar tomorrow. As much as people think virtual events or virtual seminars are so much easier than a physical, 
it's actually a lot of moving parts you want to kind of take that into consideration before you start and kind of not almost assume it's going to be absolutely fine kind of I'm quite bad I always prepare for the worst Chris and Zoe always kind of have to bring me back down to earth and be like actually this is going quite well um but I'm always kind of like contingency plan contingency plan um so what you want to do is make sure you're kind of ahead of the game before you start so four weeks out you want to start deciding your topic you want to get to know your speakers you know your you know your attendees, you know the organizations that are going to be attending this. So when you're discussing the topic and you're meeting your speakers, like share that knowledge with them and almost ask them to take that on board because it's so important for them to do that because you don't want to be delivering a session that actually isn't going to be received well by your audience. Um, It is quite daunting to do that. So just be brave with that and, and kind of push for that. You want to start creating a webinar page and understanding how that flow will work from the signups to the actual webinar day um, and then start your promotion. So when you're going through those phases, I've popped some questions there to kind of ask yourself as you're going. Um, when When you think about the targeting, there's a lot of heritage organizations that promote other heritage events so reach out to those find out if they can put your event on their calendar and see kind if they will promote it for you um we've got some useful links that i'll be able to share afterwards as well for that and then finally at this stage you want to kind of define the responsibilities and the roles of who's going to be helping you on the day we tend to run our webinars with three people um so you have the external or internal speaker And then you have your host, so that's Chris today, and then you have your production, and that's Zoe today. The role of these are essentially to just support one another so that you're not doing this on your own because it is a big task. So Zoe's role today is to support Chris and the audience and then Chris's role today is to support me as a speaker. If I fumble or my internet crashes or something like that, it's essentially Chris's role to jump on and keep the audience engaged until I come back. And it's nice to have that as a speaker. It's nice to know that you've got that kind of backup should anything go wrong. Um, and then obviously when it comes to the Q&A, instead of me kind of looking at my laptop or kind of trying to look at you at the same time, Chris is going to be asking me the questions and Zoe's going to be supporting him on that. So it's kind of a, a process together rather than doing it all on your own. Two weeks to go, and that's the next big milestone. This is kind of where you want to recap with your speakers if you haven't already. You want to make sure that that webinar page that you've promoted actually is being reflected in the webinar. So is that content going to be the one that's delivered on the day? Hopefully I've delivered the right content today on what was given in the blurb. Hopefully all 300 of you are happy with that. Um, obviously, if not, please do let me know. Um, but that's kind of what what you want to do. You want to review your speaker slides. We're all guilty of not getting it to the speakers in advance, to the host in advance. And Carmen, I do apologize because that was me this time. Um, but you do want people to look at those slides and you want to you want to make sure you're happy with the speaker slides. So kind of make sure you've got that point of contact with the speaker and that relationship with them to be able to be like, how are the slides going? Do you want to jump on a call and chat through them? I'd also, what we also do at this point is use that speaker slide kind of check-in as a rehearsal for the webinar process. That way you get them on the webinar link, you set a practice one up, you kind of make them go through that process of joining as a speaker so they can see what what to expect on the day. They can see what the Q&A function's like. I tend to join on my phone as an attendee so that then while we're in this briefing of going through the slides, I can submit like test questions so that they can then kind of know what they'll be looking for on the day rather than this all being just brand new information. If at this point you can introduce them to the host, that would be brilliant so that then they're not meeting on the day of the event, but, if not, but that's not always possible. So that's okay also. Um, And also just to remember, you're not running this webinar alone. You do have a team of people. Well, I say a team of people. I know organizations are very small, but you do have resources, whether they're kind of in it with you for the whole duration. You've got people you work with that you can have a chat with and be like, I'm actually a bit stumped on this. What do you think about this slide? Talk to them, kind of have a chat with them um, so that you're not doing it on your own because it can become quite a lot. 
you don't want to forget about your marketing. So at this point, because you've seen the new slides, you know more than you did on the blurb before. So you need to share with your attendees why they should join. What new information do you have to grasp those last minute attendees? I say last minute, they're two weeks ago, so not that last minute. Um, but what kind of more can you give them? Where can you create that FOMO vibe for them? Okay, next milestone is your one week to go. In theory, this is the calm before the storm. I tend to call it the buffer week um, because as much as the two weeks to go is such an ideal location, it is very rare that you're at that point. So you want to be able to give yourself that one week before to if there is any last minute things that you need to share or you need to find out, then you have that week to be able to do that because um, you don't want to be doing that the day before the webinar because you've got too many other things things to think about you almost want to be calm the day before the webinar you've ticked everything off on your checklist you're ready so that's what this week is for also don't forget about your marketing at this point also we tend to split this up by acquisition and retention what does that actually mean so acquisition is reaching more attendees that haven't signed up already and retention is converting those attendees from them signing up to actually attending on the day. So you all would have experienced that from us. You want to kind of give them more, feed them more information that you know to be like, oh, don't forget, you want to sign up or don't forget to join us. Have you put it in your calendar? Like everything like that kind of little pinpoints where you can be like, reminding them but subtly and kindly and obviously you don't want to spam them so make sure you break those up as well um again creating that FOMO the fear of missing out which I think we all have at the moment okay and it's here the webinar day the planning doesn't stop here you're kind of you're at your webinar day this was basically us all this morning you want to check in with everyone so you have a a chat, make sure everyone's okay. Internally, we do. You don't really want to overly bug your speaker. You, the speaker's got the diary invite in their inbox for this time, so you know when they're joining. One thing I actually didn't mention is we tend to join our speakers for our individual webinars half an hour before so that they have time to do any last minute checks. So when it comes to the webinar day, we put that invite in for 30 minutes before the session. We have a last minute chat before the attendees come online. And then we kind of go live when the attendees join for the time that the webinar is set. In this time, you kind of want to go through your checklist. So you want to check the microphone. You want to check the internet. You want to check the screen share works. You also want to check you've clicked record. I'm very guilty of not doing that. And it's the worst conversation that you have with the speaker after they've just delivered a wonderful session. And you have to say, I'm so sorry, but I didn't click record. It's you don't want to go down that route. Um, also, remind your speakers to have a glass of water with them. As you can tell, I've got one next to me, but I'm speaking too fast, so I can't grab it. But it is so important to have one near you so that you kind of it brings it makes you feel comfortable. It also is something that as a speaker, you don't think about. So as a support, that's something that you can be like, oh, you're going to be fine. Do you have yourself a glass of water just in case you need? It's, it's comforting. It's nice. At this point also, you don't want to forget about your marketing. There's three different types of attendees that we found. Those that sign up way in advance. So they're at your four weeks. They've signed up and then they attend. So they're brilliant. You've also got those that sign up but don't attend, but maybe they catch up the recording afterwards. And then you've got those that sign up on the day of the event. So what we tend to do is send a 15 minutes to go email to those that have already signed up, which you all would have got this morning. And then also a 15 minutes to go reminder email to those that haven't signed up already, but might still be interested. And we had quite a few sign up this morning after that email was sent. So it's nice to see that come in as well. Okay, so the webinar has gone amazing. Everything's over. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't end there. The post webinar is just as important as the webinar itself. There is such thing as post webinar blues, especially in this virtual world. As a speaker delivering a webinar, it is quite exhausting. You have to kind of give this energy off. You have to you're nervous, you're kind of thinking of a couple of things at once. So you want to protect your speaker. So as well as the half an hour that we do before, we also do, well, we ask if the speaker is available for 10 minutes after. 
that basically just allows us to have a chat with the speaker, tell them how the webinar went, give them any feedback if we've got it already from ourselves, because while the webinar is going, we're looking at the attendee numbers, if they drop, if they spike, what different things happened at those different times, was it because of an internet crash, was there a demo, did the video not work? Things like that, you kind of want to feed back to them and also just check they're okay. Obviously, when you're in a bigger event, it's harder to do that, but that's where our kind of extended Q&A where Carmen's waiting for me will be quite nice because I'll be able to have a chat with her afterwards and talk to her and see kind of how she felt the session went. It's nice to get an external point of view. You also want to ask for feedback and it does seem quite like a simple request, but it is so important. You also want to have different parts of that feedback that never change. So we keep, we have two questions that don't change for all of our feedback forms. It's our NPS rating, so net promoter score. And that's when you ask someone, um, would you recommend this session to a friend or colleague? And the rating zero to 10. And if people score, I think it's zero to six, that's seen as like a negative. If it's seven and eight, it's a neutral, and then nine and 10 is a positive. We aim for a positive NPS score, but getting a nine and 10 is quite hard. And also for myself now filling out these feedback forms, I know so much more about what that question actually means to someone. And I tend to be a seven or eight type of person. So I feel like I need to start going into that nine or 10 or maybe a six phase to actually, because that's actually where people will kind of start to realize whether you really like the session or not. Um, so that's one thing that we always compare and that allows us to be able to compare our different webinars on the different net promoter scores that we've got, as well as asking for further comments, obviously. Um, and then also we have our rating out of five. So for each webinar, we have that question that kind of asks people to rate it out of five and it allows us to then compare those also. Um, and then also ask for further feedback on that. Um, Another debrief you kind of want to, oh, one thing just to note on that is that feedback form is not going to be right the first time round. We changed ours so many times to make sure that it actually was asking the right questions. So as part of the webinar team debrief, which I'm moving on to now, is pick up what maybe you didn't receive feedback on from that last webinar and what you do want to receive next time. So it's keeping that in mind as you're going. Um, with the webinar team debrief, you want to talk about maybe if there was a dip in numbers, why do you think that happened? Did actually the session trans into a bit of a sales pitch? If it did, that probably won't go down well with your audience. So kind of bear that in mind also and push that a bit more with the speakers and be like, look, we know this doesn't work with our audience. So please don't transition it into that. But give your subtle expertise throughout the whole webinar. Um. Then you're looking at the post webinar promotion. So we do still do this where we think that this process is going to be a lot faster than it actually is. But capacity is such a big thing. And especially at the moment, because everyone is doing so many things at once. And also you don't have that separation of work life anymore because I'm currently sat in my living room where I also watched Interstellar last night. So there is no separation of kind of that work life balance. It is just constant so you want to make sure you're building into your plan the post webinar promotion and production so that includes editing the recording if you need to adding any captioning if you can again we use rev it is really good they do charge um so there are probably some out there that don't i know youtube does captions they're not always amazing but they are good to kind of start off with at least you're making that first step um but it's kind of taking that into con like taking that into the process and not underestimating it because it does take that bit of time and attendees always want to see the recording and the slides right away because obviously they want to keep learning. They love what you're giving them. They want to keep learning. But I think if you communicate to them that that will be with you next week and stick to, try stick to that as much as you can, they'll be understanding. Because one thing I do want to kind of say with all of this is right now is the time to prepare to like kind of test these things out because audiences are so forgiving like you have all been a pleasure to kind of do these webinars for because you've been so understanding of the situations that we're all in and if anything was to go wrong 
everyone's in the same boat. So now's the time to practice it and keep going. Um, but yes, I think that is everything from me. And I can now go into questions, Chris, if you'll have me. Absolutely. Thank you very much for that. That was great. Some really useful tidbits there and some really great tips and tricks. I'm going to take the questions from the very top because I'm we've only got sort of nine to ten minutes for them. Um, first one is is one I've got a, a particularly strong opinion about, but we'll go with you first. How long is the ideal webinar? Oh gosh. Um I we tend to go for a 30 to 40 minute presentation with then a 10 to 15 minute live QA. I don't know if that is known as the ideal webinar. If you do have a strong opinion on it, Chris, I'd like to hear. Um, but that's what I think kind of works so far. Um, you can go longer, but then you have the worry of going on too long um, and then getting that feedback of people being like dropping off or not enjoying the content. Yeah, purely from a content perspective, I've kind of got the the takeaway that it's it's all about the it's all about two things. It's all about the content in the audience. Um mm a lot of people like to put specific times on content like video shouldn't be any longer than this or if it's audio it shouldn't be any longer than this when actually if you step back and think about it consumers are creatures of we're habits we're habitual people um and if the content's good we'll we'll tune into it and um, so that's the thing to focus on and how i always put that into perspective is you know kind of raise your hands if you've ever watched making a murderer back to back to back to back to back, to back. always how many like podcast episodes have you listened to one after the other um books how many pages of a book can you read without putting it down it it spans all different mediums of content it's all about the content itself um i think when we started we kind of just put things in motion i think going back we would we would let the audience lead us a little bit yeah so we kind of how long would you like to see these sit for and mimi alluded to that in, in your talk where like we noticed you in at the beginning of lockdown people were asking more questions so we, we went with the audience we're actually tearing it back again now because you know they're like people's time is a lot more precious at the minute because they're working longer hours all virtually so it's it's a bit of both it's a bit of focusing on getting good content and in really paying attention to your audience i think yeah next uh question from chloe um what do you recommend for evaluation from the audience post event i know you talked about this a little bit uh, briefly but maybe if you could give a, an example of what we use as well yeah definitely so we uh, create ours in type form um, and zoom webinars have a great feature where you can put the link into the webinar as you're creating it so when people leave that form pops up for them straight away and um, so that's quite a nice way to get it straight out to them or you can do an email sent straight away but for the actual content of what we ask um, it's that nps question where it's would you recommend it to a friend or colleague can you rate the web the actual delivery of the webinar out of five um ask for them to explain a little bit more as well and we tend to make that not a required no we do tend to make that a required question because that's really useful information if someone gives you a three but doesn't say why you're not going to learn anything from that so you need that kind of why do you feel that way answer um and then we also ask the question of have this has this webinar made you film that you've been more digital this is what we do over at charity digital with heritage digital we do have a different um feedback form so you'll get a different one sent to you tomorrow but they're kind of our key things that we like to capture and that we've noticed in the past two years have kind of made a big difference on how we deliver our webinars as well having that kind of open text box really well works yeah i think it's a case of of deciding what metrics you want to to have in place mm -hmm. to measure um, and using the feedback form, obviously you've got your, your on, you know, your, your, your on on screen engagement time. You've got how many people signed up, how many people joined. But the feedback form is is a really good way to to get into the nuances of what actually you can prove. It's a real good time to listen to, to do what we're saying. Kind of listen to your audience, ask them what the you know what time. That's good good place to ask them if the time works for them. If yeah. If the program works for them, you know, if it's whether it's Zoom, Microsoft, go to meet any of the others, if that works for them, would they like to see any others? What content, other content would they like to see? Any engagement features that they'd like to see? They're really good. Um, it's a really good opportunity to to kind of milk all you can from the audience and to, so you can kind of go on to, to start fresh. 
I think it's also a good you don't want to be scared to then change that afterwards if you do that first feedback form and you're like I have not captured what I need to from that that's you haven't failed like that's not bad that's good because you're actually recognizing what's wrong so then change that next time because you have the opportunity to do that again um so don't be afraid that's that's a very poignant um part of it all isn't it it's be brave test iterate those those three things um next question from sarah anyways um she said that I mean, you just mentioned the attendee numbers. Uh, I think she thinks we've chosen not to show how many people are on this call or um, or list of participants. Can you say a bit about this, please? Whether you feel showing uh, the number of people on the call the help builds a sense of participation and sharing, or yeah. conversely, can make people feel anonymous and not anonymous, anonymous, uh, and distract from a, a, a sense of a sense of individual conversation between the speaker and each participant. Yeah, I actually was talking about this yesterday with Carmen because I tend to join all our webinars as a, as a host because I'll either be hosting or I'll be back of house. So I see all this stuff. So I can see that we currently have 323 people online. I've got seven questions outstanding. I've got some chat. I can see all that. But recently I've been transitioning into Zoe hosting quite a lot of ours and Mia joining as an attendee. And you do feel a bit, I'm like, oh, how many people are online? What's going on? And you want to know what's happening. So I do understand that, Sarah. However, with the platform we use, Zoom just doesn't allow us to choose whether people can see that or not. I think it would be quite nice to be able to see that because I think it gives the attendees a bit of a buzz to know that they're part of that many people. Um, and especially because I know stuff like that is available, I find it quite hard to not see it and when I attend other events I'm like oh why can't I see the attendee numbers I'd love to know how many people were there so I completely understand where you can feel like that maybe it's a bit detaching so that's definitely some feedback to zoom that we should all protest for and say we want to know from an attendee perspective how many people are online at that time and um, when it comes to a zoom meeting you can see that number and I think in teams you can see that number and like I say each platform is different so um it's all part of finding the right platform for you and your audience. Thank you, Mimi. Um, next question from Colette. How do you decide on time? Do you ask your audience in advance using social channels? Or do you start off doing test and learn when you start uh, different times, days, that sort of thing? Yeah, um, this is a great question. And I was meant to mention this. Um, I would say, like Chris said, we decided ours quite early and we probably didn't reach out to our audience as much as we could have. Um, but I would say pop a poll on social media, ask them what works for them. Uh, we did this recently with a networking event that we did. And in our kind of registration form, we said, what time would you most prefer if you were to attend networking? And we were actually quite surprised by the response. Um, so I think it is worth kind of putting a post on social media, just do a poll or something like that on Twitter or ask people to kind of share with you. Or if you've got like an event page live currently, add to that for your next event and be like, what would you would you be interested in this changing next time? And same with the feedback form. That's a great opportunity to do that as well. Exactly. And I think what is important here is once you find one, be consistent. Mm. Um, I know you mentioned that in a talk, but it wasn't until we built in consistency to our webinar program that we really saw engagement explode, essentially. And like, go on. I was going to say, and also as a team, I felt so much more relaxed because I actually <laughs> knew what was happening rather than it just being like, we're doing a webinar tomorrow. It was like, okay yeah it's it's fortnightly we've got a couple of weeks I have like a massive event calendar that kind of has all our dates planned out and if we haven't got a webinar scheduled then it's like what are we going to do we fill that gap now as a team um which hopefully people enjoy but it's kind of keeping to that consistency is is quite lovely actually works on all fronts so one final very quick question just to sign off um from a breakout which platform do you feel most people are using Zoom versus Teams, for example, and why have we chosen it? Um, I think it completely depends on your audience. So I think ask them that question. Again, you could do another poll on social media. Um, we went with Zoom purely because I feel most comfort comfort comfortable with it and therefore I can teach Zoe how to use it so that she can run things so smoothly. 
when I've used, te- I love Teams for kind of messaging and stuff like that, but I don't kind of fully, und- I'm not a tech savvy person, so I don't fully understand it when it comes to webinars, but someone might be the completely opposite way. It's just because I've used it so much. I actually didn't know what a webinar was before I started here um, and then went straight into Zoom and I, I just, it fit like a glove. So I've stuck with it. Um, but again, ask your audience, look at what you use already and then go from there. Perfect place to finish. Well, thank you very much, Mimi. That was incredible.